to be in the house of the Lord one more time. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Are you excited about what God is getting ready to do for you? For you in your life. I am so excited, so good to be here today. We're going to start this praise and worship off. We're going to go back old school if y'all don't mind. Can we do that tonight? Can we do that today? Come on, cool. Let's go. If you know the songs, I want you to go ahead and sing along with us. And it goes something like this.
She had an aneurysm. So and she didn't know God. So God put me in that room with that lady that did not know God. But that's how he works. Because he said, God, Coco, I want to use you. You don't know what's going on, but I want to use you. So during that time, During that time when, when she was laying there and my family was there, we began to pray. Just the hum. She would do that. I didn't understand it. I would hear it. So one day I walked over there. I said, why do you keep humming when my family comes in to pray? Because I don't know what else to do. And she said, and somebody say, just say, I said, somebody. We all know who that was. Because if she couldn't call on Jesus or didn't want to call on Jesus, all she would do is, Jesus. So we began to talk. And I remember going to her. She said, oh, do you see? I said, yes. She said, sing your song. Mm. I said, oh, <laughs> how I love Jesus. That's a hook up right there. I said, oh, oh, oh.
I will walk out this hospital because they counted me dead. They said I only had a 20% chance of living. I said, you don't know the God that I serve. And if he loves me, he loves you too. Just put your trust in Jesus. No matter what you have done in the past, put your trust in Jesus. And he will do everything that you need him to do. You are walking out this hospital. Jesus. She said, are you sure of that? I said, I'm very sure of that. Because he loves you, he loves you, he loves you, he loves you, he loves you. And you deserve it all. Oh, the praise, yeah. I told her, I said, say, God, you deserve it. Yes. Oh, the praise. Because you were. Something else so profound. 
And you know, and a lot of times our pride do mess us up. Our pride do hold us back because we just know, uh, I don't want to. Or for me, I'm afraid for someone to say no. I'm, I'm afraid to be shut off. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid of that. So I said, God, what, what, what do I do? And I just began to cry. And I heard this song on the radio. It says, Love, deliver me. Tonight, and so I'm 
I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful to God for family and friends. Father God, I thank you for this opportunity to, to again stand before your people and proclaim and profess what you have given me to share with them on this evening. God bless you. And may heaven, as my daddy would always say, smile upon you. Amen. Last week I preached a sermon and I, I went back home again. And I don't know about y'all, if y'all have been in this predicament where you have um, you have had a conversation with someone and then you got home and you thought about the conversation. Get back and you like to think about it. You, you want to add some more to it. Amen. And so um, on last week when I preached this message, uh, I had worked on another message and something that my spirit said, you're not finished mm. with that message. Mm. It's something about it that I'm just not finished with the message because I believe there's more to it. All right, because you can't just read a scripture one time and get an understanding of it completely. Sometimes you have to go back over and over and over. And each time you do that, the Holy Spirit will reveal something that you didn't miss. It's just that you didn't On these, on these three scriptures. I just started meditating on it again, and I said, well, Lord, what else could I give your people that I didn't give them the first time? And then all of a sudden, a flood gate opened, and so many things uh, began to come out of me that the Holy Spirit was revealing to me about these three scriptures. 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 8. Second Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 8. And last week, I preached this message out of the King James Version. And this week, I'm going to be out of the New Living Translation because out of this translation, I saw some things that I just really wanted to, to, to dive into. Amen. Second Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 8. And it reads, verse 6, remember. But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. Hmm. You must each make up your own mind as to how much you should give. Don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves the person who gives cheerfully. Verse 8 says, and God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. My sermon title changed from last week. This week it is Connecting to God's Promise. Mm, right. Isn't that something amazing about this? I, I don't know about y'all, because again, we're talking about giving, and, and you know what I said last week, that when you talk about giving in church, people get upset because there they go talking about the money, but it's not so much the money that they talk about, it's what they do with the money that upsets people. Mm -hmm. So I feel like if we here at Esau have accountability for what God has blessed us to have, What we are doing with what God has given us. Amen. And I think that's the problem in our churches when we hear that the pastor is living in a $10 million homes or buying private jets. We get upset by that because we think about all the other things that we feel are important. Mm -hmm. But look at what this scripture says. <laughs> look at what it says. It says, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will receive a, 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 larger, a larger crop. Meaning, here's what our problems are. As individuals in our lives, what are we planting? How can you expect to receive something you didn't plant? How can you expect to receive something that you didn't plant? So if you're a farmer and you decide to plant just 10 plant seeds, what can you really expect from 10? But what if you planted a thousand or two thousand or three thousand? So what this is using is this, this, this analogy is, is it should equate to our lives. We are the farmer. What are you planning in your life and what are you expecting if you're not a planter? How can you expect 
something you've not planned. How can you expect good if you're not planning good? How can you expect help if you're not doing anything to ensure that your health is improved? How can you expect when you're not planning anything? Because it says here, remember this, talking to you. You have to remember this, not your mother, not your father. It's you. We walk an individual life. This life that we live, it's our life. It's you that this scripture is talking to. Remember this, you are the farmer. You've got to plant if you want to reap. Yeah. But most people want to reap, but they don't want to do the work that's planted. Because in order to really live a fruit-filled life, you've got to do some work. Yeah. See, the farmer just doesn't go out there one day and plant corn. It's a process. Yes. Yeah. It's a process. He has to till it, fertilize it. He has to do some things to it in order to plant for the seed to grow. And in our lives, we are not planning what we need to grow or to produce the fruit that we expect. We just want by osmosis for it to happen because God loves us so much. And I'm a good Christian and I don't really bother nobody. But that's not what it says. It says that in order for you to receive, you have to give. It's an action word, meaning you have to do something. We got to stop believing or thinking that it's just going to come because we're nice. Mm -hmm. It's not about being nice. It's about doing some work. And it uses the farmer. Why would he use the farmer in this particular commentary? Because farmers traditionally have been hardworking people. It's, it's a lot of work to be a farmer. It's, it, it's, a lot of, it's a lot of work to do to some of the jobs that we do, but to be a farmer, it's an around the clock, it's an every day of it. There's no off time because even in the winter time, he has to do some work to prepare for the springtime, to prepare for the summertime, to harvest. To, you understand? It's a process. And if certain things don't line up, being a farmer can be a, 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 a very debilitating profession where you're depending on the harvest to feed your family. So, in this scripture, it says that if we want to, 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 to have a harvest, we have to plant, and we should be generous in our planting. Because if we are generous, we can expect what? Generosity. We can expect if we plant, but you can't expect nothing if you don't plant. That's why people have a problem, and I really do. I don't know about y'all, but I've always had a problem with titles. I, I really don't like titles, but this is the problem we have with these millennials. They want, but they don't want to do the work that's necessary to receive the very thing that they're wanting. Amen. That's the problem we have. That's the problem we have with millennials. You know, we all got these different generations, and each generation has looked at the, back, the last generation and said, you're sorry. Oh, you're not, not sorry. Take that back. You're weak. You couldn't handle our generation. And I looked at some stuff. I don't think I could have did well in the 50s and 60s based upon what I've seen people endure. I, I didn't come up in that particular time. I came up in the, in the 70s, which was a little, little bit easier, but we still had some parents that held our feet to the fire. You know you couldn't go out until you did what on Saturday? Some work. There was some work that was necessary for us to go out. You just couldn't go out because you were a kid. You was, you was responsible for some things in the house. And so, like this farmer, you got to plant if you want some productivity. Mm. I, I, you know what? I, I, I love this. Let me tell you why I love this. Because all of this is, is training for the one day when it's a thousand people. And I preach the same message. The response will be overwhelming. <laughs> it will. I, I know it's just a few of us, and, and, and I know it is hard, and you don't really want to say nothing. It is, and it's okay. I have to condition my mind, because in my mind, I see a thousand people. In my mind, I feel like I'm walking on cloud nine. In my mind, I feel like I'm preaching to the multitude of people, but I'm hearing justified. <laughs> and it's all right. It's all right. I don't know. And listen, I'll never tell you to turn to your neighbor. I'm not going to make you say amen. You don't have to say nothing. But I know this is resonating with somebody. You know why I know? Because it's hard for people to sometimes let go in here. It is. It is. And I'm gonna, as we go through, we get to six, seven, when we get down to seven, eight, you don't understand why the giving is it, it, it's, it's so much needed in your life and who it benefits and how it's going to benefit you individually what you're giving God. I, I know what this does. I know what this does. When people come up to me and they go, you've been a comedian for 32 years and I never heard of you. How come? I said, I don't know how come you never heard of me, but I have survived 
for three decades plus two more. Hallelujah. Paid every bill. Gave two ex-wives everything they needed to start their next life. I ain't mad. And my current wife, before 50, is retired, can live her life, wake up in the morning, and choose what she Jesus. desires. Hallelujah. That's the position that a lot of women wish they were in. I'm just telling you, it comes from the giving. So let's go down to verse number seven. Verse number seven says, you must each make up your own mind as to how much you should give. But don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves the person who gives cheerfully. This is the scripture that when I got away from y'all last week, I just, I started thinking about it. Because we get caught up again in titles. What do we call everybody that gives? We call them titles. Now listen. Everybody has a different degree and an understanding of, of scripture. Some people have a prophetic, some people have a, 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 a common, some people have a, um, a I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't know, I don't, I don't know what all that. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna preach it as the Holy Spirit gave it to me. We have Old Testament, New Testament. Old Testament, they were under the law, they were titles. Jesus died that puts us in the dispensation of grace, meaning we're living now in grace. Jesus paid the price. Yeah. So we all can understand that. So when people say tithing is an Old Testament uh, thing, it is. But look what it says in 2 Corinthians. It says you must make up your own mind as to how much you should give, which means whether you're in the Old Testament or New Testament, giving is still required Amen. in the house of the Lord. Amen. It's still required. It's just that now you're not held to the law. You're now under grace. Meaning, what is it that you want to give because you want to plant, as in verse 6, those seeds. Yes. So you can plant $1 seeds, you can plant $100 seeds, or you can plant a thousand. It's up to you. But it says for you, not me, not your mother, not the previous pastor, not the next one, not the deacon, not the guy sitting next to you. It says for you to make up your mind as to how much you should give. It's you. It ain't me. I heard people say, I'm going to give to your church. No, you give it to God. I'm just going to oversee what you give, but you're not giving to me. You're giving to God. You're giving to God so that you can have a harvest. Now, if you give to this church, we have a harvest. Mm -hmm. you, did, did that make sense? Yeah. You, can, you can give to this church, and when you give to this church, we have a harvest. See, people have given. We have a keyboard. We have chairs. We have a place to go. We have sound. Not me. We, us. It's a team. This is a community. It's Asaw Community Church. It's not Asaw Rodney Church. It ain't Asaw, Asaw Elder Church. It's an all-inclusive of all of us. See, the reason why in some places they make it all about the person who has the microphone is because the person who has the microphone makes it about him. Because that's who they look to. And I'm trying to tell you that it's not about me. It's about all of us. It's all of us collectively working together, believing what these scriptures say on the pages. What does it say? It says that you must make up your mind. You must give. And you shouldn't be put under any pressure. Let me tell you what pressure is. The Lord told me today that we were going to collect $1,500. We need 300 more dollars. I need six or seven people right now to come up here and just come on, go, go get it out your pocket. That's, see, that's the pressure. And you know you've been there. I've been there. I've seen it. Oh, uh, listen, now we have much we got. We need 150 more. The Lord told me we're not going any further. That's a lot of pressure. And then reluctantly, you start taking them. You're not taking the money because you want to be blessed. You're taking the money because you want him to move over the service. Jesus. I've been in services that have been held up for 45 minutes because they were not leaving until they got this number that they said that the Lord told them. And I'm like, how can the Lord tell you something that his word said that people should give? Mm -hmm. And if all they give is $5, then you bless that $5 you keep on moving. Because God is going to give you the provision. Yes, He's going to give it to us. He's going to give you what you need. The problem is we can't trust mm. So we think what we should do or what we receive. That's what a lot of people do. That's what a lot of people do. They know what they, they they know how much comes in, and then they think about what I have to do. But you always gotta remember what you have to do is what you put yourself in to do. 
Amen. <laughs> it is not even our needs. Because God says he will supply your needs. The problem is your wants have superseded your needs. Yes. And now you're in trouble for what you want based upon what you need. Amen. But at the end of the day, how many of us have ever really suffered for our needs? Mm. Our needs have always been met. Yes. We've had shelter. We've had food. Yes. We've, we've had the ability. Our, our needs have been met, but sometimes our wants. Yes. Yeah, you can buy a Toyota Corolla or you can buy a Lexus. That's a, that's a want. Amen. A need is transportation. You can, get some, you can get a need. You can get a need. You can get a $500 car and get from A to B. And that's what you choose to do. That might be your need. But we went, I want more than that. Then I'm struggling. And then when you're struggling, you say, well, Lord, you said you would take care of it. Wait a minute. He didn't put you out there on that land. That was your choice. Jesus. And then sometimes when people are really, really struggling, I ask them, what was your giving like? Oh, man, I ain't got nothing to give. But then you can't, well, I, I, but then you're not solely, mm. I, I, okay. because our mindset tells us that we can, this is what we can do. That's what our mind tells us. Our mind tells us, I got this much coming in, this is what I can do. But we got to trust that he can do more, because if you get a little further, then you'll find out what happens when you give, it comes with a promise. God cannot go back on promise. Mm -hmm. I can go back on promise. Matter of fact, when we was kids, if you went back on the promise, you would say, Jack up, boy. <laughs> y'all remember that? Come on, everybody here grew up in the city. Everybody had that little city slam. You never heard that one before? Yeah, if you told somebody you want to do something, you would say, Jack up, boy. I was playing. That's what they said, Jack up, boy. So when they said that, you knew that the promise was broken. All I'm saying is that, that I, 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 can, I can break the promise. I can break the problem. I probably have broken some. I tried not to because I try to be a man of my word. I don't remember too many of them, but but I can because I'm human. Amen. God can't not not do what He says He's going to do in His Word. Jesus. It says for you to make up your mind as to how much you should give. Don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. See, here's the beautiful part about giving. It's the beautiful part. What does it say down at the bottom of that verse? For God loves the person who gives cheerfully. God loves. Now, isn't it amazing how many times people talk about God loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, but then they can't even trust him to give. Mm. We love until it's time to give, and then we get quiet. Jesus. We get quiet. That's why churches have to do what they do. That's why they have to put the pressure on people. Mm. Because people don't give. You can go to every church in America and ask statistically how many people give this according. And they will tell you. Roger can tell you. He used to do the finance of the church. He can tell you how many, what was the percentage of people that really gave and the other people that were going on for the ride. That's why they got to do it. That's why in our church we got to have all the deeds. Why? Because we got to have money coming in. Why? Because we need more and more because stuff is going out and we don't have people that's giving us why we got to have the days. That's why they got to have pastor day because we don't pay the pastor so he can't wait to get to the anniversary so they get come here, am I telling the truth? We got to, we don't pay him. If we could just pay the pastor what he deserves, we wouldn't have to have a pastor's day because he could get what he needed to out here, but he doesn't. So we got to have this day for him. Then we got to have pastor appreciation one. Then we got to raise some more money. So we got to have deacon day, deaconess day, trustee day, children's day, choir day, anniversary. Remember when I was a choir, 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 you can attest to this. When I was a kid, every church we had choir day where you would invite all these churches. Ten churches would come. Every church that came couldn't stay long. We got to sing because we got something else to do. And I knew they was lying. They didn't want to be there. <laughs> so my father said, we're not going. Here's the check. That's all they wanted was the check because at the end of the service, what would they do? Now Mariah gave $1,000. St. Benetine gave $500. So and so. Because it was all about raising money that people can give. So we can have programs or we can just teach. I prefer to teach. I prefer to preach. I prefer you to get it whenever you want to get it. You might get it today. You might get it tomorrow. You might not ever get it. You might get it. It's not, that's not my responsibility. My responsibility is to teach and preach and then bring the qualified people to do the same thing. Amen. That's it. That's my responsibility. My responsibility is not to force you. I'm not going to say, oh, we got $100. Y'all know we need $750 to pay the rent. 
I just wish God would just, I'm not going to do it. If we don't have the money to pay the rent, the door will be locked. Jesus. And we'll go home. And people will say, what happened? And I'll say, oh man, the people just didn't want to get me, man. Would you be embarrassed? Absolutely not. I wouldn't be, why, why, why would I be embarrassed? Why, why, why would I take the embarrassment if people don't need it? That's not, not, I'm not here. God said it to not me. Jesus. So, so would I be embarrassed? No, no, but I'd be with it. I'd go home. <laughs> And then I said, hey, man, I tried. I, I gave God all, all maybe, maybe I didn't hear right. But then again, I look at where this comes from. Yes. So I know what God is doing. Mm -hmm. I know the position God has put us in. Why? Because this church is planting seeds Amen. across the community, not across the state, not across the country, not across the world, here. Mm -hmm. We're planting seeds. We're planting seeds and we're telling people the truth. And when you tell people the truth, sometimes your growth is slow because it's the truth. And, and people are afraid of the truth because they've been lied to so long. They're scared to look around and go, wait a minute. They got to at least show us their true hand. This can't be who, who they really are. And when you show people the simplicity of life and who you really are, because you're trying to sow good seeds of, of just, just being just regular folk, People are scared. People don't know what to do. People don't know what to do when you're just nice because they're not used to people being nice. They're not used to it. They're used to it being conflict in the church. They're used to conflict. They're used to conflict. And when you just don't have none, they keep looking and they're scared. There's some people that need to be here right now, but they're afraid to come because they've been hurt. And they don't want to be hurt again because they've been hurt for whatever reasons. And all I'm saying is, look, all we're trying to do is just do is between the pages. That's all we're trying to do. That's all we're trying to do. We ain't trying to, we're, not, we're not trying to make it a complicated, it's not a complicated thing. It's just respond to what you hear. Jesus. So for God loves the person who gives cheerfully. Here's why the sermon is titled Connecting to God's Promise. Verse number eight says, and God will mm -hmm. and God will yeah. not the pastor will, not the first lady will, not the elders, the board of directors, not the mayor of the city. It says, and God will provide all you need. Amen. It does not say all that you want. It says he'll provide all that you need. Now, uh, now listen to me. If you are sowing and your harvest is spreading, that will include your wants. I want this particular house. Well, you're going to get that particular house because you have this particular harvest coming in. But you can't expect that house if you ain't sold. If you're not playing, you can't expect everybody I know who has the house that they want to live in sold and got in there. Something happened. It's a transition that happened. Nobody started off in there. They worked their way and they sold into it. They, they, they put some work in there. My first house was a trailer. Amen. Single wide, 14 by 65. I lived in the trailer park. But my grass was green. My, my, my hedges was, was shaped up. <laughs> The only, you could, matter of fact, you could come into the trailer park and knew which house was mine just by the grass. Because, see, people in the trailer park had trailer park mentality, like, this ain't the house I really want to be in. Listen, you got to be thankful where you are. Yes, you got to be thankful where you are. Yes. I, I was in the trailer and happened. Drove home every day. Happened. And then it was able to, 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 to move up to a, a three bedroom house in California. Grass was green. Hedges were cut. See, most people tell you what they're going to do when they get to the big house. No, just like giving. It has to be a habit in your life. Yes, it, does. it has to be a habit. You can't just go. You, you, you think that you're going to get an income tax check and save it? I've never met a person who got an income tax check and at the end of the year still had all the money. No, because you're not used to that kind of money and you're not used to having money and saving and you're used to pulling back off of it every so often. Then next you know it's gone and you don't even know what you're spending on. But if you just put a little bit away, a little bit away, a little bit away, it becomes a habit. This giving is a habit. Yeah. It 
it becomes second nature. You don't have to think about it. Matter of fact, all the athletes will tell you that the more they practice, it becomes muscle memory. They can do it. They don't even think about it because it's muscle memory. Because it's a habit. They practice doing it. Yes. And we got to do the same thing. Because if we do it, God said he will provide all your needs. What do you need? Not what you want. What do you need? You can put your wants in there because you're going to have enough to take care of your wants. And you're not going to struggle with your needs. Are oh, there going to be some lean things? Absolutely. Why? Because things happen and we, we look out for people and sometimes people need this. And, and there's nothing wrong with asking for help. Nothing wrong. And I told my wife this many times. You can help whoever you want to help. Just don't take the responsibility. I'm not responsible for you. I'm responsible to God to give you a message. You're responsible to hear the message and apply it in your life because you made the commitment to Christ for what he's done for you. I didn't die for nobody and I can't believe for you. Amen. Verse 8 says, and God will provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need. Not some of the things. It says you will have everything. See, that's why I had to preach this again. Because I was missing some of these things last week. See, that's important. It said he will provide all that you need. Then you will always have everything you need. God said, this is a promise. Meaning if I activate my giving, this has to happen. It has to happen. It has to happen. It, can't, it has to happen. It, ha it has to happen. Why? Because I said it? No. Nope. Because it's real. Yes. Yes. It's real. It says, and God will provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need. And here's the beauty of all of this. It says, and plenty left over to share with others. Mm. Sure. Connect to God's promise. Yes. That's what we ought to be doing. Because yes. when you give, it blesses you and your household that you have enough and it says that you have so much, all of your needs will be met, and you'll have enough to help others because God loves us for helping those who are in need. God loves that. God loves it. God loves it. And if God loves a cheerful giver, then we should make God excited about our giving. If we make God excited about our giving and he loves us for doing it, and we say we love him for what he's done for us, Man, I think it's about to fall. We don't have to have none of those days. All we just have to do is have service. That's all we're going to do. Listen, as long as I'm the pastor, so that's all we're going to do is have service. Now, we're going to have an anniversary. We're going to have a church anniversary. We're going to have that. Once a year, there will be a church anniversary. And here's the beautiful thing about ASAP Community Church and the church anniversary. We just won't have it. Amen. And as we grow, it will expand. So the first one might be outside in the parking lot. It might be some hamburgers and hot dogs. I, I don't know what it's going to be. I don't, I don't know just yet. But whatever it is, we just going to have an anniversary. Mm -hmm. and, and you can bring some people and just come to the anniversary. And then maybe next year we'll have a few more people and we might rent a facility. And then the next year we might have a few more people. We want to maybe rent another facility. I, I don't know where it's going to go, but, but we're going to have an anniversary. And the reason why we're going to have an anniversary is because I'm thankful that God has preserved us another year. Yes, yes. Because when we started out, hmm. <laughs> all right. And we started out, it was some, some days I was looking out the windows and looking at all the cars go to the Buffalo Wing Place. And I saying to myself, God, how come they, how come they just not coming down here? And it was two and four and six. And then all of a sudden, we started doing the work. And I realized that we're not here because of the numbers. We're here for the work. We're here for the assignment and what God wants the church to do in the community. Mm -hmm. And that's why the name of the church is Asaw Community Church. We're serving and giving begins mm -hmm. because that's what we want to do. We want to be a testament of what the church is supposed to do. We want to serve and we want to give. Amen. God bless you. Amen. And I thank you for being a part of tonight's service. Amen. Amen.